Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to tell you about the work that we've been doing towards engineering living replacement heart valves for children with congenital heart disease. Uh, this project truly capitalizes on the combined expertise and resources from all three partners in the Head Rogers Center. The outstanding group of trainees in my lab and Pulse on Terra's lab in TBEP, our collaborators at SickKids, UHN, and with Tissue Regeneration Therapeutics, a Toronto-based biotechnology company. Now, you've already heard earlier in this session about the high frequency and burden of congenital heart disease. And amongst the most common CHDs is Tetralogy of Fallot, which involves four structural anomalies, including right ventricular outflow tract obstruction, which is often associated with stenosis or narrowing of the pulmonary valve. And you can see the effect of stenosis in these movies. A normal valve has th three thin pliable leaflets that fully open when the ventricle contracts. In contrast, the stenotic valve has thickened fused leaflets that prevent the valve from opening fully. This creates a high resistance to flow from the ventricle, which if untreated in the pulmonary valve, leads to inadequate oxygenation, cyanosis, and ultimately risk of sudden death. A common approach to relieve the obstruction within months of birth is to widen the outflow tract using a transannular patch and then augment the pulmonary valve to fill that widened conduit using a patch typically made from Gore-Tex or a pericardium. While this approach provides relief from severe pulmonary regurgitation, both uh, materials ultimately lead to mild to moderate regurgitation within years, uh, within years of surgery, uh, often necessitating intervention. And both materials are unable to grow as the child grows, so very limited. This need for pediatric replacement valves that provide long-term function and are capable of growth is the most compelling reason and motivation to engineer living replacement tissues that mimic native valve function. Approaches to engineer valves can be broadly classified as either in vitro on the left here or in situ on the right. In vitro approaches grow valve tissue in the lab using cells uh, seated on scaffolds that will degrade away as the cells produce their own tissue to form cellularized uh, valves or valve tissue that can then be implanted. In contrast, in situ approaches implant acellular scaffolds and rely on cellularization by resident migrating or bloodborne cells uh, in the body. Each approach has its merits, but in all cases, engineered valves uh, function or been shown to function only up to a year in animal models with leaflet contraction uh, leading to regurgitation as the primary mode of failure. Leaflet contraction is due to adverse remodeling of the engineered tissue after implantation. And there are at least three contri contributing factors uh, as I've listed here. First, cellularization of bare scaffolds in situ is an unregulated process that likely involves migration of highly contractile myofibroblasts and smooth muscle cells from the neighboring tissues into the scaffolds where they remodel the scaffold and contract the matrix. Second, the microstructural organization of valve scaffolds that are used currently doesn't mimic that of native valves. And as a result, the scaffolds have moved very differently than do native valves under blood flow. This can lead to excessive forces being applied to the cells within the scaffold, activating them to remodel and contract their matrix. And then third, we've shown that endothelial cells on native valves secrete protect protective factors that can actually suppress fibrosis. In valves uh, that are engineered, these cells and the protective factors they produce are often absent. So our approach to pediatric heart valve tissue engineering attempts to address these three issues in an effort to reduce or even eliminate leaflet contraction and valve failure. Our approach is summarized here. We use an in vitro approach to, to engineering the tissues uh, in which we combine cells and materials to grow these replacement tissues in the lab and thereby avoid the issues of uncontrolled recellularization that occur in situ. The cells we use are autologous. They're isolated from the baby's own umbilical cord. And I'll show you in a moment, this is a great source for heart valve tissue engineering. We seed the cells onto nanofibrous scaffolds made from a biodegradable polycarbonate polyurethane developed by the Sonterra lab. And I'll show you shortly that we can make fibrous scaffolds with mechanical properties that closely match those of native pediatric pulmonary valves. We also have the ability to exercise these tissues uh, in vitro to further tune the structural and mechanical properties. Currently, our goal is to produce tissue sheets that could be used as patches for valve augmentation, or could even be shaped into a trileaflet valve using the origami technique shown here. To further suppress fibros fibrosis in vivo, we're designing nanoparticles that can be loaded into the scaffolds to provide sustained release of antifibrotic factors that are otherwise absent uh, post-implantation.
So I'm going to show you some of the highlights of our work in progress towards each of these aims, uh, beginning with the cell, the cell source. The cells we use are mesenchymal progenitor cells isolated from the Wharton's jelly of umbilical cords. These cells called HUC-PVs are provided by TRT, the local biotech company, who perfected this method for a variety of regen med applications. This source is particularly well suited for our pediatric application because the cord is provides a readily available source of autologous cells that would otherwise be discarded. Uh, Shuka Parvan Najad in my lab has found that HUC PVCs are highly proliferative, much more so than bone marrow derived mesenchymal stromal cells, which are a more common source for valve engineering, and such that we can take a single cord and from that get enough cells to produce a full replacement heart valve. Furthermore, HUC PVCs synthesize uh, lots of extracellular matrix, abundant amounts of the main structural components of valve tissue, including collagen, elastin, and glycosaminoglycans. And importantly, Shuka has shown that all these things can occur in chemically defined media that's free of animal products. This is challenging to do, but is an important step for eventual clinical translation to humans. Our immediate next step with these studies is to test the valves, the engineered valves that we're creating with these cells in pigs as a large animal model. To enable these studies, uh, Neda Latifi and Monica Licci from my lab have established novel methods to isolate, expand, and promote tissue production by pig umbilical cord perivascular cells. This was an important step as Neda and Monica are now producing allogeneic valve tissue that we can test directly in pigs. And this is being done in collaboration with Jason Maines and the six, Sick Kids team uh, starting in the new year. So we think this approach to produce autologous tissue uh, in the months uh, before surgery is necessary, months after birth before surgery is necessary, holds lots of promise, particularly to better regulate tissue production than what occurs currently with in situ cellularization methods. We're also improving on the scaffold designs. Current scaffolds are often produced by electro spinning polymer fibers to produce aligned structures like that shown here. Uh, and these, these constructs then provide stiffness that is higher in one direction, the, the fiber direction, than in the cross fiber direction, as shown on these tension strain curves. Unfortunately, this behavior poorly mimics native pediatric valves, shown in purple. Uh, you can see these valves are much more compliant, they're more stretchy, they're non-linear, and they're highly extensible. Uh, so to address this, Bara Marani in my lab is 3D printing fibrous polymer scaffolds using a modification of electrospinning called melt electrowriting. Barms developed a generalized method to 3D print scaffolds with bulk, uh, with these prescribed bulk mechanical properties. And you can see that in the scanning electron micrograph that these structures include fiber waviness to enable that high extensibility and non-linearity non we see in pedi pediatric valves. And this works very well. You can see here that Barms scaffolds have properties that much more closely match the complexity of pediatric heart valve mechanics. So we're quite excited by the potential of this technique to generate native valve-like mechanical properties. As an additional tool in our kit, Edwin Wong in my lab has built a bioreactor with which we can controllably stretch these engineered tissues to mechanically condition them to further fine tune tissue organization and mechanical properties as needed. And so by mimicking native valve function, we expect these biomimetic scaffolds will provide physiological function immediately upon implantation in contrast to current approaches in which the tissue must, much, must undergo substantial remodeling with greater potential for maladaptation. Our final strategy to suppress fibrosis and contraction is to deliver exogenous antifibrotic molecules from nanoparticles loaded in our scaffolds. This idea stemmed from our work on heart valve disease and our discovery that C-type natriuretic peptide or CMP is secreted by endothelial cells in the heart valve to protect against fibrosis. You can see that here, when signaling of CMP is disrupted in mice, the valves stenose, they become regurgitant, very similar to what we see in tissue engineered valves. Tissue, tissue engineered valves typically lack an endothelium as there's no autologous source for valve endothelial cells. And so we've hypothesized that the lack of endogenous production of CMP and other molecules is one of the reasons that engineered valves fibrose. To address this, Natalie Secure and Shirley Chung in the Santer lab have created coated nanoparticles to deliver and release CMP as a model antifibrotic. By loading the nanoparticles on the scaffold, we aim to deliver CMP in a sustained localized manner to suppress fibrosis in that period early after implantation before the scaffolds are able to endothelialize. 
So this is work still in progress, but Natalie and Shirley are in parallel exploring the application of these nanoparticles to suppress other forms of fibrosis like that in the heart. So just to summarize, uh, there really is great potential for valve tissue engineering to address the unique needs of CHD patients, but current approaches have really not succeeded primarily due to adverse tissue remodeling. We anticipate that these approaches, there are approaches that better mimic native valve structure and function, such as those I described today, will be needed for clinical translation. I'll conclude by acknowledging the agencies and donors who've funded this work over the past several years. Uh, thank you, and I look forward to the discussion.